The Queen is dead. Long live the King. The death of Queen Elizabeth II of Australia raises constitutional questions about the relationship between Australia and the monarch and legal issues about what action needs to be taken in Australia to accommodate a new monarch, such as oaths and seals, etc. My name is Anne Toomey. I'm a professor of constitutional law. And in this video, I'll explain some answers to some of these questions. The first question is, does King Charles III instantly become King of Australia, or does there need to be some kind of legal proclamation or any kind of act on Australia's behalf? And what law applies to the succession of the Crown in Australia? Is it a British law or is it an Australian law? Since the 1600s, the law has recognised the mystical idea of the monarch's two bodies. One is human and can die, but the other is institutional, a body politic, which lives on through successors instantly assuming the role and the office of monarch upon their predecessor's death. In the United Kingdom, at least since the reign of Edward VI, there has been no interregnum, meaning that there's no gap between monarchs. And that is where we get the saying, the king is dead, long live the king, or in this case, the queen is dead, long live the king. So that's the position in the United Kingdom. The change of succession occurs at the instant of death without any legal action taking place. But what about in Australia? The position is the same, because we use the same rules of succession to determine who is queen or king of Australia. Now those rules of succession are a combination of common law rules of inheritance, so they're judge-made rules that have been made over many centuries, and various statutes, such as the Bill of Rights of 1688. Those British rules form part of the law that was received in Australia upon British settlement and became part of Australian law. But in those days, the colonies could not legislate to change certain British laws, which applied by paramount force in this colony, and the laws of succession to the Crown fell within that category. Over time, however, Australia gained independence and the ability to change those British laws that became part of Australian law particularly as a consequence of the enactment of two statutes, the Statute of Westminster in 1931 and the Australia Acts in 1986. Now, during that same period, the Crown, which was originally seen as one and indivisible, with just one British monarch reigning over all the dominions, became divisible. So while it was still one individual who was the monarch, he or she wore metaphorically, different crowns. So one crown for the United Kingdom, one crown for Canada, one crown for Australia, etc. And what does that actually mean in substance? Well, what it means is that when the monarch fulfills constitutional responsibilities about Australia, he or she acts on the advice of Australian ministers. And when exercising powers under the Canadian crown, he or she would act on the advice of Canadian ministers. The consequence of all of this is that Australia now controls the rules of succession to the Crown of Australia. Now, can it change them? The answer is yes, but it is difficult. The Constitution itself does not give a direct power to the Commonwealth Parliament to make laws about such things. So instead, we have to use what they cleverly put in, which is a constitutional escape hatch. And that's in section 5138 of the Constitution. It allows the Commonwealth to make laws at the request of the Parliament of each of the states on subjects that only the United Kingdom Parliament could have legislated on at the time of Federation. It means that if all the states and the Commonwealth through their parliaments cooperatively legislate, they can change the rules of succession to the Crown of Australia. Now they did this back in 2015 when each state and the Commonwealth legislated so that males no longer have priority in succeeding to the throne ahead of their older sisters. But this was done consistently with all the other countries that have the Queen as their head of state, all of which are known as realms. While theoretically there could be different rules of succession with different monarchs, so far no realm has decided to take that path. Instead, if a realm seeks change, they normally prefer to move towards a republic, and that's what Barbados did recently. Now, back to the death of the Queen. What does that actually then mean for Australia? 
Well, as we have chosen to maintain the same rules of succession as the United Kingdom, then at the very second the Queen died, Prince Charles became King of Australia. While proclamations may well be issued for ceremonial reasons, this is not legally necessary to cause the change. It will be automatic, well indeed it was automatic and immediate. There is no opportunity given to make an active political decision about it. Now the next question I'm commonly asked is whether Camilla becomes Queen of Australia. The rules in the United Kingdom are that when you have a reigning queen, also called a queen regnant, being the person who inherited the throne in their own right, then her husband is not generally given the title of king. For example, Queen Victoria's husband was called Prince, Prince Albert. Same with Queen Elizabeth II's husband. Neither of them took the title of king. Now, this is because people would assume that someone who had the title of king could actually exercise constitutional powers, and that wouldn't be the case. But where you have a reigning king, then his wife is given the title of queen but as a queen consort, not as a reigning queen. For example, the wife of King George VI was given the title of Queen Elizabeth, later known as the Queen Mother. But this title of queen does not attract any constitutional power. So Camilla, as wife of the king, is titled queen, but this does not make her Queen of Australia or give her any powers at all with respect to Australia. Addressing her as Queen is just a matter of courtesy. She has no legal or constitutional role with respect to Australia. The next question is whether the death of the Queen would have legal consequences for officials that swear allegiance to the monarch. For example, would it terminate the whole government because the government and the Prime Minister got their commission uh, in the name of the former monarch and not the current one? Would everyone from politicians to judges and statutory office holders who have to swear an oath of allegiance have to redo their oath before they could validly exercise their powers? And the answer here is a big no. I say that because opportunistic people will no doubt flood the courts with silly cases about this, arguing that any decision that they don't like was made by a person who had not sworn an oath to the new monarch, or that any law of parliament they don't like is invalid because of oaths, etc. Now let's be really clear, these arguments are complete rubbish. They will be tossed out, and yes, if you bring a case like that, you're likely to have costs ordered against you because you're going to be wasting everyone's time and clogging up the courts with this nonsense. So my strong recommendation is don't do it. Yes, such arguments did have some validity a few hundred years ago, and it did cause chaos in the United Kingdom. As a consequence, various laws were then made to solve the problem. For example, the UK's demise of the Crown Act of 1901 says the holding of any office under the Crown, whether within or without His Majesty's dominions, shall not be affected, nor shall any fresh appointment thereto be rendered necessary by the demise of the Crown. And what does the demise of the Crown mean? It means the death of the monarch. And this law applied to Australia as part of Australian law, as well as the other dominions. So if there had been any doubt about this, and there probably wasn't anyway, but it would then have wiped out any lingering issues about whether, those, um, whether the death of the monarch has any legal effect of this kind. The Australian mon colonies, of course, had already sorted a lot of this out. Uh, the New, New South Wales Constitution of 1855, while it did require members to re-swear an oath upon the monarch's death, it was only upon notification of the monarch's death because, of course, the monarch could have died six months before the news ever got to Australia. These days, however, not even that is necessary, and that's confirmed by Section 124B of the New South Wales Constitution. So no oath, new oath, is required as a matter of law. In addition, Section 49A of the Constitution Act of New South Wales says that holding, the holding of any office under the Crown is not affected by the demise of the Crown, and it's not necessary for any office holder to take a new oath. In practice anyway, existing oaths already include 
an oath of allegiance to the monarch's heir and successor. So if you've sworn an oath to the queen and her heirs and successors, you've already sworn an oath to King Charles. In addition, Section 8 of the Crown Proceedings Act 1988 in New South Wales provides that legal proceedings are not affected by the demise of the Crown. Similar provisions exist in other states and at the Commonwealth level. Commonwealth members of Parliament, for example, swear their oath to the monarch and her heirs and successors. To the best of my knowledge, the only state that actually requires members to re-swear their oath after the death of the monarch is Victoria. Nonetheless, parliaments may voluntarily choose to have their members take a new oath for ceremonial and symbolic reasons if they want to. Other things that will eventually need to be changed include the various seals at the state and commonwealth level that are used to seal official documents and appointments. Again, the seals continue to be valid and effective well after the monarch has changed, as this has always been the case, all the way back to the 1800s, because Seals took a long time to come out from the United Kingdom. The heads on coins will eventually have to be changed, including also the head on the $5 banknote. But again, currency remains valid regardless of whose head is on it. Passports will need to be changed um, from their reference to the Queen to that of the new King. But all of that can be phased in over time. So if you've got a passport that lasts for 10 years, don't worry. Parliament will also presumably enact a new Royal Style and Titles Act, which sets out the King's new titles with respect to Australia. And this is an opportunity to add some thought as to how the King should be described in his titles in relation to Australia today. Lots of ceremony will accompany the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Traditionally, there are 10 days of mourning, culminating in the funeral on day 10. Flags are flown at half-mast, except on the day of accession. Bells are rung in churches and gun salutes are held. In the United Kingdom, there's an accession council which is held. Uh, proclamations are made around the country by people who actually have the title of herald, which is quite extraordinary these days. And the new king will make various oaths. No doubt there will be church services and public memorial services around Australia too. Previously, Upon the death of King George VI, the last monarch of Australia who died, a public holiday was held in Australia on the day of the funeral, and various places of public entertainment were closed as a sign of respect, such as cinemas, theatres and sporting venues. Shops displayed portraits of the king, surrounded by black or purple crepe, and Boy, Boy Scouts were even directed to wear black armbands. People would wear mourning attire. This was all quite a different era from the one we live in now. So how we mourn today is likely to be very different from how we did that long ago. These days, in times of mourning, people tend to turn up to some kind of symbolic location and lay flowers. This is not really a terribly environmentally sound practice, and it does end up with a nasty, rotting mess of flowers on the ground. So my suggestion here is that we actually start a new tradition to show our mourning by instead planting a tree. It could be called hashtag royal tree. It's appropriate because the Queen has planted a lot of trees on ceremony occasions, including in Australia. And the new King is also, as we well know, a supporter of the environment and a tree lover. It's also an ongoing living remembrance rather than a lot of dead soggy flowers. And frankly, we do need more trees, not only for the sake of our environment, but for our own mental health. So my parting recommendation to you is that as a sign of respect and remembrance for the Queen, instead of either engaging in crazy litigation about oaths and seals or going out and leaving flowers to rot by someone's gate, perhaps we should instead all go out and plant a tree. Thank you. I hope you found this useful.